Thank you, Stanley, Marsha, and Joy for leading us in singing praises to God this morning in our worship service. And thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us for this morning's worship service. What a blessing it is to be able to come together once again. And I pray that you're doing well and remaining strong in the Lord. Um, God is good, and uh, we have every reason to worship him. And I, I count it such a blessing and joy to be uh, not a part, not just about a part of the uh, family of God, but to be a part of this church family here at the San Diego Japanese Christian Church. And I do miss seeing all of you and being together with you uh, in person, but uh, I, I am grateful to God that we are still part of this family and that uh, we can worship the Lord together, um, even through uh, these online means. So um, I pray you're doing well and uh, remaining strong in the Lord. And uh, we'll make it through this uh, we'll be able to um, see each other and, and be together with each other. And the, and the wonderful thing is that um, not just here on this earth, but we look forward to the time that we can worship the Lord together for all eternity. And nothing is going to separate us from God or one another at that time. So we truly look forward to that. And that is, that is our faith in God through Jesus Christ. And, uh, and we want to declare that faith right now through the reciting of the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. 
he descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's continue on with the pastoral prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we give you praise, again, for the blessing of being able to come before you in worship. We are so grateful for your love for us in the sending of your Son, Jesus Christ, that Jesus came, that he died for our sins and rose from the dead, and he is now at your right hand in glory. And we look forward to the day of his return. We thank you that, as Jesus said, I do not leave you as orphans, that through Jesus you have given us your Holy Spirit, and you are actively work at work in our lives. We rely on you each and every moment, and we find it a joy to be able to worship you, even as Jesus had called his disciples to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you that you have given us your spirit so that we can do so. We pray for this world that so desperately needs to know of you, to know the good news of Jesus Christ and the salvation that is found in your Son. We pray that as a church you will continue to empower us to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And we pray for this world that they will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus through the hearing of your word, through your gospel. Father, we pray for healing for this world even as we continue to deal with this coronavirus pandemic. We pray for healing for our members who are dealing with different ailments, that you will continue to give them encouragement, comfort, and your peace each day. We pray for uh, comfort for those who mourn uh, their loss of loved ones, that you will continue to be their source of consolation, and that you would minister to them, Lord, in a powerful way. And Father, we pray for anybody who may be uh, experiencing financial difficulties or other kinds of uh, difficulties. Maybe it's emotional. Maybe it's it's just a, a sense of loneliness that you will meet them at where they are at and that you will strengthen and encourage them, Lord. As we continue on, Lord, with this uh, time of feeling like isolation, Lord, that we would be mindful of one another first in prayer, but also in reaching out to one another in love, um, through phone calls, through uh, uh, visits as, as is appropriate and, and, and as we are able, but Lord, that you will help us to uh, truly be connected together as a family of God, as a body of Christ, and that you will continue to do your good work in each and every one of us. We thank you for the blessing of being able to come together this morning for worship. We ask that you will continue to guide and direct this time. We entrust this time and our lives into your care. We give you all the praise and glory. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's continue our worship service with the children's message. And today's children's message will be given by Psalm Hasley. My name is Psalm Hasley, and I am here to talk about why I didn't read the Bible for 28 years, despite becoming a Christian as a kid, and, it based, and why I read it now. And it basically boiled down to three reasons, which were that it thought it was old and thus dated, and it, if it's old and dated, then it's only kind of relevant, and if it's only kind of relevant, then any advice that it has to give is only kind of like generally so, so helpful. It's like, and these weren't things that I ever would have said or even consciously thought. They were just things that I believed in the back of my head. And it's like, but the Bible says about itself in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This wasn't my experience when I read the Bible when I was younger, though, and this is why. So the average Bible has 1,200 pages, and the things that are important to me are marriage, because I'm married, family, because especially parenting, because I've got kids, and I'm a child, so how do I relate to my parents and friendship? And off the top of my head, that would maybe fill about 10 pages of stuff. It's like, and the Bible spends a lot of time talking about the character of God, how God relates to his people, how bad people can be, how God's people should act. And that fills out the other 1,190 pages or so. 
It's like, and it doesn't seem like there is a whole lot of overlap between these two things, which is why the Bible didn't seem like it was very relevant. However, about three years ago, the light bulb switched on. I saw that if you look under the surface, it's like past just what the Bible explicitly says about stuff. There's actually quite a lot of overlap between things that I care about and things that the Bible talks a lot about. So let's take a look at a concrete example. So in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 31 through 32, it says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. So this verse is relating marriage, which is something I care about, to Christ and his church, how God relates to his people, which is something the Bible spends a lot of time talking about, which means that if I see a verse about Christ and his church, I know that there is a principle for marriage somewhere in there. So I can take a verse like Romans chapter 5, verse 8, where it says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we are still sinners, Christ died for us, and I can apply that to marriage. So this verse shows that God loved us even while we were his enemies. It's like, and so if my husband is angry at me and says something that hurts my feelings, I do not now have permission to go and be mean back to him. I am called to love him in that moment, even though he is thinking of me as an enemy and treating me as one. Or in Titus chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. So this verse shows that Jesus loved us for the purpose that we could be more like him. So as my husband and I love each other, it's like we should be becoming more like Christ through all of the things that we're going through together. It's like, but since most of you are a little young to be married, it's like, let's talk about something a little more helpful to you. So the body of Christ or the church or Christians, it's like, is a picture of friendship. In Philippians chapter two, verses three through four, it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So I don't know about you, but I tend to think more about how well my friends are treating me or whether I am having fun. It's like being around these people. It's like then whether I am being a good friend to them or like helping them and like thinking of them. It's like, and since ideally there is an aspect of friendship in marriage and in family relationships, this verse can apply to marriage, family, and friendship. So the Bible is old, but it's not dated and it's extremely relevant. Like if you read it, you can even find out things like why people are lonely and sad during this pandemic time besides being connected by video technology and stuff like that. But I went 28 years before starting to take Bible reading seriously, so it's never too late to start. Hope this was helpful. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Psalm, for giving us today's children's message. Thank you very much. We want to continue on with our worship service with our study in the Gospel of Luke. And today we're going to look at Jesus's Last Supper with his disciples. Um, and we'll be looking at Luke 22, verses 14 through 38. Um, but before we get into God's word, uh, let's let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again, we come before you. We thank you for um, your word to us this morning uh, through the children's message, but also through this time in our uh, study of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, as we coming coming towards the end of our study of the Gospel of Luke, we ask that you will continue to lead us by your Holy Spirit, that you will give us understanding, and you will guide us, Lord, uh, in your truth, and that we would walk in your truth, Lord, that is to be doers of your word. So please encourage us and speak to us during this time. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Have you ever thought of how you would like to spend your last day here on this earth? Well, today we will be looking at Jesus' last Passover meal with his disciples. We will see how Jesus ministered to his disciples during his last meal with them and see the final words of instruction he gave to them in anticipation of his fulfillment of the purpose for which he came. Today's scripture passage is Luke 22, 14 through 38. Let's begin by looking together at verse 
verses 14 through 16. When the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. The preparations for the Passover having been made, now it was time. The hour had come for Jesus to recline at the table with the apostles to enjoy their meal together. Jesus began the meal with the following statement. I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Jesus expressed his love for his disciples here, even as he was fully aware that his suffering, that is the cross, was awaiting him. He made it clear that this would be the last Passover meal he would eat with his disciples until he returned to establish his kingdom upon this earth. He then proceeded to lead his disciples in partaking of the Passover meal. Before looking at the recounting of Jesus eating the special meal with his disciples, I just want to point out that there are two key elements in the Jewish observance of the Passover meal. It's the unleavened bread and the wine. We will see the importance of these in just a minute. Let's read on from verse 17. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. Jesus begins the meal by taking a cup and giving thanks. For the Passover meal, there are actually four cups that are used. And the four cups represent the four phrases in Exodus Chapter 6, verses 6 through 7. Say, therefore, to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Here Jesus was taking up the first cup of sanctification and give, gave thanks for it. He then shared it with his disciples saying, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. Jesus again made it clear to his disciples that this will be the last Passover meal that he would eat with them until he returns to establish his kingdom. Let us read on from verse 19. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. It is important to note that based on the order of the Passover meal, according to Jewish practice, it is evident that Luke was not giving a play-by-play -play of the whole meal here. The bread that was broken and given to his disciples here was part of what is called the Afikomen ceremony, which is a special ceremony with the unleavened bread that is conducted during the Passover meal. There would be a bag containing three compartments in the center of the Passover table. A loaf of cake of unleavened bread is placed into each compartment, each one separated from the other by a single sheet. During the Afikomen ceremony, the middle loaf or cake is removed, broken in two, wrapped in linen cloth, and hidden for a time. It is then removed from its hiding place, unwrapped from the linen cloth, and pieces are broken off to distribute to each participant in the Passover. There are three requirements for unleavened bread in the Jewish observance of Passover, and they are true of the body of the Messiah. First, the bread had to be unleavened in that it was sinless. 
Jesus was the only Jew who ever lived that kept the Mosaic law perfectly. Therefore, having an unleavened bread or body, he was qualified to make the sacrifice for sin. Secondly, the unleavened bread had to be striped. The body of the Messiah was also striped by way of the Roman whip at the scourging. Isaiah 53, 5 states, With his stripes we are healed. Thirdly, the bread also had to be pierced. The body of the Messiah was also pierced by the nails in his hands and feet and by the spear thrust into his side. Zechariah 12.10 states, They shall look unto me whom they have pierced. By being striped, pierced, and unleavened, the Jewish Passover bread is a unique picture of the body of the Messiah. The bag with three compartments in the Afikoman ceremony portrays the one God who exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In this ceremony, the middle loaf is removed. This is a picture of the incarnation when the second person of the Trinity became man in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. The loaf is broken in two. This is a picture of his death. When the Messiah came to this part of the ceremony, he stated, This is my body which is given for you. Part of the loaf is wrapped in linen cloth. The Gospels make it clear that the body of Jesus was also wrapped in linen cloth when he was removed from the cross. The broken loaf is then hidden for a time. This is a picture of his burial. Later, it is removed from its hiding place and unwrapped. This is a picture of his resurrection. Finally, pieces are broken off and distributed to everyone around the table. This is a picture of John 6.51, where Jesus stated that all must partake of his body. In that same chapter, he clearly interprets the eating of his body as believing that he is the Messiah. What is so amazing about all of this is that these practices of the Jewish Passover feast were in place already, which pointed to the coming work of the Messiah, which was then fulfilled by Jesus. It was after the eating of this bread that Jesus then took up the third cup, which is the cup of redemption that symbolizes the physical redemption of Israel from Egypt by means of the shedding of the blood of the Passover lamb. As he took this cup, he said, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus made it clear that this was a special cup that he connected it to the work that he was about to accomplish by going to the cross. He was pointing ahead to the redemption that he would bring about for his people through the shedding of his blood. Thus, in drinking this cup, it was to be taken in celebration and remembrance of the new covenant we would have with God through his atoning and redeeming sacrifice. His blood poured out for us. Now, this cup of the Passover becomes a symbol of a spiritual redemption from enslavement to sin. Jesus clearly identified himself in terms of the Jewish observance of the Passover. Therefore, the Passover is fulfilled by the death of the Messiah. Remarkably, Jesus announced the institution of a new covenant. No mere man could ever institute a new covenant between God and man. But Jesus is the God-man, 100% God and 100% man. He has the authority to establish a new covenant sealed with blood, even as the old covenant was sealed with blood. The new covenant concerns an inner transformation that cleanses us from all sin. Indeed, the cup that Jesus shared here with his disciples was the cup of redemption, which brought about a new covenant through his blood. We can say that the blood of Jesus made the new covenant possible, and it has also made it sure and reliable. It is confirmed with the life of God himself. Now let's see what happened next. Let's read on from verse 
21. But behold, the hand of the one betraying me is with mine on the table. For indeed the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to discuss among themselves which one of them it might be who was going to do this thing. As Jesus enjoyed this last Passover meal with his disciples, he was truly cognizant of what was going to take place that very night. Thus Jesus shares with his disciples, probably to prepare them, that the hand of one betraying me is with my, mine on the table. This must have been truly a shock to his disciples, probably also for Judas. To think that someone in their midst would betray Jesus. Jesus' words regarding this matter was emphatic. The Son of Man is going as it has been determined. Luke used the strong word determined or decreed to stress God's sovereignty in these affairs. The title Son of Man helped the disciples appreciate that this was part of God's will for the Messiah who would reign. In other words, Jesus was going to the cross no matter what, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Jesus pronounced woe on the betrayer as he had on the religious leaders and on Jerusalem for rejecting him. It was especially despicable for Judas to share a meal with Jesus, which implied mutual commitment, and then betray him. Thus the disciples naturally began to discuss among themselves which one of them it might be who was going to do this thing. However, as the night went on, it seems that such matters were soon forgotten and replaced with other concerns by the disciples. Let's read on from verse 24. And there arose also a dispute among them as to which one of them was regarded to be greatest. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it is not this way with you, but the one who is the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like the servant. For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table, or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? but I am among you as the one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials. And just as my father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. As much as Jesus is awesome and amazing, we find his disciples to be amusing. Jesus had just solemnly shared with them that the Passover meal that he was eating with them was the last one until his return, meaning he was going to go away. And even after he told his disciples that he was going to be betrayed by one of them, the disciples had the time to dispute among them as to which one of them was regarded to be greatest. I don't know what they were thinking in doing this, but I suppose their logic was that since their leader was going away, one of them needed to become the leader of their group. They were perhaps trying to figure out which one of them was worthy for such a task. Jesus, of course, knowing what was going on, did not reprimand them, but used the occasion as a teachable moment. Jesus did not necessarily define greatness here as much as to say of how those who considered themselves as being great should conduct themselves. He did this by encouraging them to learn from his example rather than, to, rather than to take note of the world's standards. He began by stating how greatness is seen and lived out according to the world. These people lord it over others and are called benefactors. A benefactor in the ancient world had clients who were to appreciate their lower position. Glory and honor came to the leader. In contrast to this way of greatness, Jesus simply taught them to be humble and become like the youngest and like the servant. He then gave himself as an example. Based on the fact 
that the washing of the disciples' feet recorded for us in John chapter 13 is what took place during this Passover mealtime. The implications of Jesus' words to them, but I am among you as the one who serves, needed no further explanation. Yet Jesus assured them that whatever their position was to be in this world, they were indeed to be great in God's kingdom. They should be humble servants, but they had something great to look forward to at his return. You are those who has stood by me in my trials, and just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Here Jesus talked about his disciples' faithfulness. I believe at this point, probably Judas was, had already gone away to do whatever that he was supposed to. That is to betray Jesus into the hands of uh, the religious leaders. So here, Jesus is talking to his disciples. Again, Jesus talked about his disciples' faithfulness. In contrast to the betrayer, they have stood by him in his trials. Talk about Jesus giving his disciples hope. Whatever difficulties they may have experienced up until that point in following Jesus, and whatever hardships they were about to face going forward, these words must have truly given comfort and peace to these disciples as they, con as they continued to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness through Jesus. Remember, these words of Jesus came after a dispute among them as to which one of them was regarded to be greatest. Most likely, Simon Peter's name came up in these discussions, along with James and John, who were the three closest ones to Jesus among the twelve. Interestingly enough, next we have Jesus speaking specifically to Simon Peter. Let's read on from verse 31. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. But he said to him, Lord, with you I am ready to go both to prison and to death. And he said, I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied three times that you know me. In declaring that one of the disciples was about to betray him, Jesus did not single out who that disciple was. However, here, Jesus singles out Simon Peter as one of the disciples that will deny him three times. Here too, like in the case of Judas Iscariot, we see that Satan is working behind the scenes. However, we also see the divine authority that Jesus has and what he speaks to his right-hand man. After all, Simon Peter was truly one of the leaders among the disciples. Jesus, I believe, in a compassionate manner, said to Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. In speaking to Peter, he spoke to him like he did when he spoke to Martha. Remember, Martha, Martha. And he did this to get his attention. Jesus used Peter's birth name here, Simon, rather than the name he gave to him. This probably indicated the spiritually weak and vulnerable condition that Peter would be in as these things were to take place. He was not going to be rock solid during that time in his faith. Notice that it is Satan who has demanded permission from Jesus to sift Simon like wheat to shake him hard. Jesus indicates that he has given permission, and in knowing that Peter, Peter will struggle, he assures him, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. We can see Jesus' intercession on behalf of Peter here, and his vision for Peter to come through the difficult trial that he is about to face with greater faith and power to serve his fellow disciples. 
Peter, on his part, declares his faith and commitment to Jesus by saying, Lord, with you I am ready to go both to prison and to death. Jesus knew of Peter's desire to do so, but still said in reply to him, I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied three times that you know me. It could not be helped. Peter, as much as he had hoped to remain faithful to his master, was forewarned that he would deny his beloved Christ. Let's read on from verse 35 to see the last portion of today's scripture passage. And he said to them, When I sent you out without money belt and bag and sandals, you did not lack anything, did you? They said, No, nothing. And he said to them, But now whoever has a money belt is to take it along, likewise also a bag, and whoever has no sword is to sell his coat and buy one. For I tell you that this which is written must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with transgressors. For that which refers to me has its fulfillment. They said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, It is enough. Here Jesus is referring back to the disciples' experience in having been sent out by twos to preach the gospel and to heal and cast out demons by Jesus' authority. Two such occasions are recorded for us in Luke. In answer to Jesus' question of, you did not lack anything, did you? They said, no, nothing. Jesus has been clearly telling his disciples of his imminent departure, that he will be arrested, suffer humiliation, and be crucified. Jesus' final words make it clear that circumstances are changing. Opposition to the disciples is rising. The disciples take Jesus' remarks literally and incorrectly. They note that they have two swords, but Jesus cuts off the discussion. It is enough. As we will see next Sunday, at Jesus' arrest, they draw swords then, but Jesus stops their defense in its tracks. He is not telling them to buy swords to wield in physical battle. They are being drawn into a great cosmic struggle, and they must fight with spiritual swords and resources. The purchase of swords serves only to picture this coming battle. This fight requires special weapons, as we have pointed out in the reading of Ephesians 6, 10-18 last Sunday. Jesus models this to his disciples, as he agonizes in the Garden of Gethsemane through prayer, which we will look at next Sunday. So, what are some things to consider in terms of applying what we learn in this passage to our current lives? First and foremost, we can find comfort in knowing that Jesus was the last Passover lamb. He broke his body and shed his blood for us when he went to the cross. Thus, through faith in him, we can live in his righteousness with humility and confidence. We are set free to enjoy God and to serve him. Three other things I would like to suggest in terms of application, and we will consider these things from Jesus' dealing with Simon Peter. We are to be aware of the dangers of being self-confident. Jesus disclosed the fact that a serious trial is at hand for all the apostles, and that Peter, who was the greatest among them in faith and devotion, would be exposed to the greatest danger. In such circumstances, we need to humbly rely on Jesus' help. We cannot assert that we can be strong in the Lord without the Lord and without his help. We are to be aware that Jesus is interceding on our behalf and that we can and should turn to him continually. He knows our every weakness and he truly cares and loves us. As Jesus prayed for Peter, even as he was to be sifted by Satan, Jesus is continually interceding on our behalf. Because Jesus brought about our redemption, the forgiveness of our sins as the atoning sacrifice for our sins, we are able to go directly to Jesus with all our concerns. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 
reminds us of this. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We can also rest assured that in our relationship with Jesus, as long as we trust and obey him, we will continue to mature as his child. Peter came through his fiery trial with deep scars, but through that experience, he was able to strengthen his brothers and sisters in Christ after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. He was instrumental in the growth of the church and in the training of disciples and church leaders. Trials and times of testing will come. It is not a question of if, but when. We are reminded in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. What does this mean? Our confidence is not in ourselves, but in Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and Lord. He is victorious over sin and death, and will complete the good work which he has begun in each of us. So let us not lose heart. Let us press forward with humility and faith in following Jesus with great love, joy, peace, and hope. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for Jesus' calm and, and just cool manner, even as he was aware of the person who was going to betray him, the fact that one of his closest friends was going to deny him three times, and, and, and knowing that he was going to uh, be on the cross in, in less than 24 hours, that he was able to enjoy this meal with his disciples and express his love to them and his concern for them and giving them encouragement. Such is your love for us, Lord, and we thank you. And help us to be able to respond to what Jesus said as a disciple who was not at that table with him, but as a follower of him now through the good news that has been proclaimed throughout the ages, that we too would humbly follow Jesus, that we would be servants of Jesus, and that we would continue to trust in Jesus in every circumstance, and that we would continue to be strengthened in our faith so that we can strengthen others. Father, thank you for your goodness and your love. We do entrust our lives into your care and ask that you would do your good work in us to your glory. We humbly pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let us conclude our worship service with a song of response and then with closing prayer. Oh, 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 oh,
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.